Well, hi, class. In my absence this week in the classroom, welcome to our message of the New Testament session. Obviously, this is going to be done via video. However, you still have your fill-in-the-blank outline and the slides as well um, to follow along with me. I am going to have the slides. It looks like a bad newscast from the 70s, I know. Uh, I'm going to have the slides scrolling behind me. They're, they may be a little bit blurry, so the easiest thing is for you to use that as your cue to follow along on your own. Uh, before we introduce today's subject, let's remember where we have been the last week. Uh, last week, we uh, did three things. We continued the discipline of reading through the lenses of historical and literary context questions in the Synoptic Gospel. So remember, we looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their similarities and differences. We also uh, looked at those similarities and differences in the light of their distinct presentations of Jesus, and we saw that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are each telling, they're not telling the same story, they sort of are, but they're so uniquely saying what they want to say about Jesus in their own way. And then third, we looked at the distinctives of each synoptic gospel, the raw materials for those distinct presentations of, B, of, of Jesus. Dating, audience, structure, themes, and aims. Uh, and we also looked at Jesus' parables at the end of class discussing, discussing their function and characteristics. Okay, what we are going to do today is the Gospel of John. We're going to spend an entire session exclusively on the Gospel of John because this Gospel has probably been the most important in shaping the way Western Christians uh, automatically think about Jesus. So we're going to look at the Gospel of John for a few moments through the lenses of historical and literary context questions, and we're also going to be overviewing all that we can know about the fourth Gospel and what makes it distinctive in particular. Dating, audience, structure, themes, aims, all that good stuff. Well, have a look at this picture. You know that John's Gospel is a big deal when it makes it on to team Tim Tebow's eye makeup. And this John 3.16, which is written there, is no doubt the most famous Bible verse in the whole book. And the whole Bible comes out of the Gospel of John. Many of you know it by heart. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A lot of terms in that verse are very distinctive and unique to John. Uh, terms like the world, only begotten Son, this um, focus on belief and eternal life. These are major themes and terms in John that don't show up hardly at all, sometimes not at all, in the Synoptic Gospels. So simply a cursory look at this famous, most famous of all scriptures lets us know uh, that John is doing something very, very unique in the New Testament and in the biblical canon. Well, let's look at your written outline there, and let's do a little bit of reading exercises. You remember historical context questions, questions that we bring to the text attempting to discern the history behind the text. When we ask historical context questions, we ask questions of a historical nature, window questions. And if you turn to John 6, as you'll see in your outline there, uh, we're just going to read through these passages, and I'll pose some questions that I think will spur your thinking and, and help you be um, a, a faithful reader of John's gospel. Uh, verse 53 of John chapter 6, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. I, this is a really weird passage, a weird thing to say. It's not in the synoptic gospels. So what sort of historical questions would you ask to discern the meaning of John's text? I think you'd have to ask questions about John's church. How did, this, how did these words function for John's later church? And clearly, they had a sacramental function. John is reading the words of Jesus through the lens of the sacrament of communion. And there are other places in the Gospel of John where we see sacramental language, language of baptism, language of communion, or the Eucharist. Flip over to John 21, and we'll look at a couple spots here. In 21 verses 11 through 14, we find a story of the resurrected Jesus and his disciples. And that his disciples are fishing on the boat, and suddenly Jesus appears to them and tells them, as he did when he first called Peter, go fish. They pull on a very large catch of fish, 
And verse 11 says, Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. I'm sure the question strikes your mind. What is the significance of 153? And scholars have spilt tons of ink on that question. It's so hard to figure out. Some say 153 represented all the known fish species to first century peoples. We don't know. But there are tidbits like this uh, throughout the Gospel of John. Um, I'm going to save the last historical context question reading for later on because it applies to a part of the outline. But now literary. If you go back to John 3, back to John 3 and look at the first uh, at verses 3 and 4 of John chapter 3, you'll see that Jesus is having a conversation with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. This is the only place we get that term in the whole Bible, born again, so that people now talk about born again Christians. It comes from this. And uh, a great literary question would be, how does rebirth function in John's greater narrative? Um, this is the only time the kingdom of God is used in John. It's amazing. It's used throughout the Synoptic Gospels, the primary subject of Jesus' teaching ministry in the Synoptic Gospels. But in John, it only appears here in chapter 3. So interesting literary questions. If you go to John 8, in verse 58, Jesus is almost stoned because he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. And so literary question would be, how does I am function in John's literature and in the literature of that time? And we know that from the story of Moses in the Old Testament that I am is the name of God. And throughout John's gospel, he uses in Greek what we call the ego, me, or the I am that I am, the name of God to identify himself alongside the authority of God, which is why the Jews then pick up stones to stone him. And last, one more look before we move on. John 17, verse 1 says, After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And so a great literary context question would be, how does the concept of glory and glorification, how is it laced into John's greater book and how does it function? Remember, when we ask historical context questions, we're looking at the text as a window, but literary questions, we're just looking at the text as a piece of literature and trying to discern how terms and themes work across the broad spectrum of John's gospel. Let's move on to Roman numeral four and look at contextual and historical features of the gospel of John, beginning, of course, with authorship. Now, John does some of the heavy lifting for us when it comes to authorship. We really don't have, there's no name attached to the authorship of any of the Gospels. But at least John tells us where the tradition of the Gospel comes from. It comes from a mysterious figure, the beloved disciple. We don't know for certain who the beloved disciple was, of course. We'll talk about that in a moment. In a moment. But like Luke... John says, I got this tradition from somewhere. From Luke, it's a bunch of eyewitnesses, but for John, it's one person. If you look at the last chapter of John, chapter 21, verse 24, uh, Jesus is in a conversation with this figure in the gospel who's never called by name. He's called the beloved disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved. And Verse 24 says, This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. So that tells us that this is the, the John's gospel has been edited by a we. It's been edited by a community. But it goes back to this disciple whom Jesus loves, who is identified throughout the gospel using um, that same title. So what can we know about this beloved disciple, this disciple who Jesus loves? Well, first, he doesn't appear until the Last Supper in John, which, by the way, isn't a Last Supper. Nobody, uh, nobody eats, and there is no institution of the Lord's Supper. This is my body, this is my blood. You don't get that in John's Gospel. But nonetheless, the disciple that Jesus loves is reclining against Jesus, and he shows up for the first time there. Also, this disciple stands at the foot of the cross, he is the one to whom Jesus gives care of his mother before the death of the Lord. Uh, he looks at the disciple whom Jesus loved. So 
The disciple, this particular author, is there at the cross. This disciple and Peter first receive word from Mary Magdalene about the empty tomb. This disciple recognizes Jesus from the fishing boat in John 21, which precipitates the conversation that we just um, were talking about. And also, this, uh, that same chapter relates a rumor about this disciple's immortality. Now, this is strange, but if you look at the end of John chapter 21, P Jesus is having a conversation with Peter, and verse 21 says, When Peter saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus said, did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what, is that about, what does that mean to you? So lots of information about this shadowy figure who continues to appear from the Last Supper to the last chapter of the Gospel of John, simply known as the disciple whom Jesus loved or the beloved disciple. So who are some of the potential candidates for this beloved disciple. Well, some have thought that the beloved disciple is John Mark. John Mark shows up in the book of Acts. He lives in Jerusalem, and he seems to be an associate of Peter, which might make sense of Peter's prominent role in the Gospel of John. Uh, another uh, potential candidate, this is the one I would suggest is the most credible, is Lazarus. We get the resurrection of Lazarus only in John's Gospel. It's not in the synoptic stories. And interestingly, Lazarus is the only human figure in the Gospel of John other than the beloved disciple of whom it is said Jesus loved him. So the shortest verse in the Bible, many of you know this, is Jesus wept. That comes from the Lazarus story in the Gospel of John. Yeah, that's in chapter 11. Jesus wept because he loved Lazarus. And so maybe that's a cue uh, for Lazarus being the beloved disciple. Also in the passage we just read, there's a rumor that the beloved disciple wouldn't die. Well, that would make sense if the beloved disciple is Lazarus who had been resurrected from the dead. That kind of conversation might have been happening. Now, the traditional candidate, the traditional answer that the church has given for the identity of the beloved disciple is John, the son of Zebedee. This is one of the 12 apostles that we see in all the synoptic gospels. All the early church fathers say that the author of the fourth gospel, the author of the gospel of John, is the son of Zebedee. Um, we see this in Irenaeus, who writes early, 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 about 180 A.D., who says, John himself, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned back on Jesus' chest, he too published the gospel while he was staying at Ephesus in Asia. So the, the fact that Irenaeus calls him a disciple of the Lord would um, include John in the 12 disciples. And so it would equate the author with John, the son of Zebedee, one of the 12 disciples. Yet another theory, uh, which has uh, strong backing. Um, one of my colleagues at the seminary across the street has written extensively about John the Elder being um, the beloved disciple. Uh, this is in line with a quotation from Papias. Remember our friend Papias, who lives uh, probably uh, while the definitely lives while the author of John is writing. And uh, he refers to this Elder John in this quote. And the Elder John, by the way, also wrote 2nd and 3rd John, which shares a bunch of similarities with the Gospel of John. 2nd and 3rd John are later letters. And uh, that may provide, that certainly provides evidence for conjecturing that it is perhaps this early church leader, whoever he was, the Elder John. Uh, we don't know. And you have to decide whether or not it matters to you that we don't know. It doesn't really matter to me, uh, but it is very interesting that John refers to the beloved disciple as the author of the gospel, uh, the author of the tradition behind the gospel, and yet we are still left guessing as to who that was. Let's talk about dating. When does the gospel of John emerge? Uh, in a former academic age, uh, scholars like to say that John was dated very late. Late, They said the theology of John is too advanced. It had to have taken some time to develop. 
um, and, and therefore they preferred a second century date. However, nobody thinks that anymore. Uh, number one, it, we, we began to realize in the academic community that John's theology and Christology is not that far advanced from the synoptics, actually. That they're really not making, they're using different language, but John is really not making radical claims about Jesus that aren't found in the earlier Gospels, such as Mark. But the, the, the scientific reason that a late date has been overturned is called the Rylands Fragment, or P52. We mentioned this in one of our early sessions together about the, recept the, the composition of the New Testament. Uh, the Ry this is the Rylands Fragment. It's a tiny piece of John 18. That's it. But it dates all the way to 125 A.D., this manuscript. So clearly, John had to be written before that. Uh, and so this really changed the conversation uh, to recognizing that John is a whole lot earlier than scholars had assumed at one time. Now, some say that John is really early, maybe earlier than Mark, because John takes pains to present Jesus as the new temple. However, he doesn't mention the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD. And so some would say, if you're going to develop this theology of Jesus as the new temple, and you knew the temple was destroyed, you would absolutely include that. You would say, see, it's destroyed because Jesus is meant to be the new temple. John doesn't do that. Um, but the consensus now is in the middle. The consensus suggests a, a late first century date. It's based on a few things. First, there's a strong Christian tradition in the early church that John was written during the reign of Caesar Domitian, and he is late first century. Uh, there's also uh, a very pronounced tension in John between believing and non-believing Jews, and it would seem that it would take some time for this kind of tension to have developed. In fact, there's a, a Greek term that John uses that's unique to John, and it refers to believers in Jesus being put out of the synagogue, the aposynagogue, being put out of the synagogue. So it would take some time for this formal relationship or this formal tension to have developed to that point where now Christians are separating from the Jewish synagogue. Uh, we don't see that so quickly in Acts. And third, uh, it would appear that rather than John being before 70 AD, that time has just elapsed, so the shock of there not being a temple has cooled off. It's not the subject that everybody's talking about um, anymore. Well, where was John written? Well, the, the traditional view of the church fathers is that John wrote the fourth gospel in Ephesus. In fact, there's a, a beautiful Christian kind of legend from early on that my favorite author, Frederick Beatner writes about in his memoir, The Eyes of the Heart. In this tradition, John and Jesus' mother, Mary, grow very, very old together, living in Ephesus, spreading the gospel. So uh, Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. It was a hotbed of early Christian growth, and the church fathers all, always said that's where John is writing from. Uh, so who's he writing to, and what's the point? Well, look at chapter 20 verses 30 to 31, because John tips, tips us off to his purpose. He says in, in those verses, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, that Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Paul, Paul, uh, sorry, John uh, pulls no punches about his purpose, so who is he writing to? He wants people to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but there's significant evidence to suggest that G John's audience is Jewish, that he's really targeting Jews and Jewish proselytes or converts to Judaism in the hopes that they would turn to belief in Jesus. Prominent John scholar, his name is um, D.A. Carson. He teaches where I first taught at Trinity University outside of Chicago, and he says the most likely people to ask the sort of question that's being framed in the scripture we just read, who is the Son of God? They would be Jews and Jewish proselytes who know what the Christ means, have some sort of messianic expectation, and are perhaps in dialogue with Christians and want to know more. In short, John's gospel is not only evangelistic in its purpose, but aims in particular to evangelize Jews and Jewish proselytes.
that seems to make the best sense of the evidence. Um, let's spend some time now on the relationship of John's Gospel to the Synoptics. You can imagine that this has been the subject of, of reams and libraries of scholarship. John is so different from the Synoptics. Did he know who they were? Does he use them? How do we make sense of all of this trans, uh, tradition about Jesus that was floating around in the first century? And how did, did these individual gospel writers come to acquire it and to shape it? Well, there are quite a few options that have been considered for tracking this relationship between John and the other three Gospels. Some would say that John was simply not aware of the synoptics, that he does his own thing in so many dramatic ways because he doesn't know that they exist. I believe that even though John didn't use the synoptic Gospels, they shared a common oral tradition. There are similar stories. There are some similar arrangements in the stories that would suggest you have a common pool of oral tradition about Jesus that's being used among the four Gospels. Others would say that John wrote to supplement or to complete the Synoptic Gospels. This was the view of the early church fathers. Uh, they said uh, the Synoptics were incomplete, so John wrote a theological Gospel to complete them. And then a more out outlying view would be John wrote because he didn't like the other Gospels. He wanted to correct them or replace them. Uh, well, the first step to understanding this relationship between John and the Synoptics is to understand that there are a bunch of similarities that we should not overlook. For example, the testimony of John the Baptist is key to John's Gospel as it is in the Synoptics. In fact, it's more key to John's Gospel, which is weird because John the Baptist doesn't even baptize Jesus in the Gospel of John. That doesn't happen. John the Baptist plays a much different role. The feeding of the 5,000 is in all four Gospels. The walking on the water right after the feeding of the 5,000 is in all four Gospels. The misunderstanding of the disciples is a theme shared between John and the Synoptics. Some would suggest that the messianic secret theme of Mark has been transformed into this theme of misunderstanding in the Gospel of John. There is a focus on religious authorities uh, in John and the Synoptics. Jesus cleanses the temple in John and the Synoptics. He just does it at different times. In John's Gospel, Jesus cleanses the temple at the beginning of his ministry. In the Synoptics, he cleanses it at the end. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is very, very, not only there, but it's similar in John and the Synoptics. Jesus' last meal with his disciples, even though he doesn't institute the, uh, the Lord's Supper in John's, he still gets together and there, there appears to be a meal, even though we don't hear about the body and blood of Christ there. Um, and, of course, the cross and the resurrection. So big point of summary is let's remember these are all Gospels. Sometimes uh, it's easy to focus on how different John is when we should recognize that this is a legitimate gospel expression just like the other three, and there are a lot of similarities between them. The differences, however, are quite compelling. It's why John is not considered a synoptic gospel. First, we have differences of geography. In the Gospel of John, um, Jesus goes to Jerusalem a lot. In the synoptic gospels, uh, and here's our map, uh, Jesus stays in Galilee until it's time for him to die and then he goes down into the red territory. But in John, Jesus is constantly crisscrossing, going to various festivals from Galilee to Jerusalem, and Jesus spends most of his time in Samaria and Judea, in the red part in John, whereas in the Synoptics, he spends most of his time in Galilee. There are tremendous differences in chronology in John, the sequence of events. I mentioned the temple cleansing. In John, it happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In the Synoptics, it happens in the end. John is clearly playing around with chronology to make sure that Jesus dies at the same time of the Passover sacrifice and that he dies the same day of the Passover sacrifice. <coughs> this is not something the Synoptic Gospels are trying to show. It's only in the Synoptic, in John rather, that we find out Jesus' ministry is three years long. So there's a lot of chronological details that are only in John and not the Synoptics. In the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus doesn't do miracles. He performs signs. Th this is a word that's particular to John. Um, 
that, that, that they're signs, not miracles. Uh, instead of casting out demons out of people, as Jesus does in the Synoptic Gospels, he doesn't do that in John. He casts the devil out of the world. That's the sign of Jesus' divinity. Also, a major difference between John and the Synoptics are discourses. Jesus has these long and magnificent speeches about things, not parables. I mentioned in John, Jesus doesn't even talk about the kingdom of God except one time in John 3 to Nicodemus. So his teaching ministry is much, much different. And then finally, there are differences in Christology, uh, in the view of Jesus Christ in John. Um, now, it much, I mentioned before that too often the differences in Christology have been overplayed. Uh, every gospel writer has a very high Christology. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But John has his own set of language um, that's very exalted sort of language to communicate that. Uh, language that identifies Jesus more directly with God than the synoptic writers do. Um, here's a quote from Alan Culpepper in his commentary on the Gospel of John. He says, Gradually, interpreters have come to realize that the situation is not that John recorded one part of Jesus' ministry and the synoptics another part, or that the synoptics described the public teaching of Jesus and John his private teaching to the disciples, <coughs> or that the synoptics are historical and John is theological, but that all four gospel writers offer a portrait of Jesus that is both historically based and theologically developed. So you might say that Mark emphasizes of the kingship of Jesus, and uh, Matthew emphasizes the Jewishness of Jesus, and Luke emphasizes the universality of Jesus. Uh, by contrast, the Johannine Jesus is the revealer, sent from above to reveal the Father. He is neither a part of this world nor welcome here, though he was with God at the creation. The world neither understands him nor receives him. Jesus spends his ministry attempting by means of both the signs that he does and the enigmatic, or enigmatic words that he speaks to call others to see that he is the revealer. So how do we make sense of this set of similarities that are, that are very, very clear and forceful and this set of similar differences that are, that are stark and that are striking? Well, uh, our friend who we just mentioned, D.A. Carson, has suggested that we understand this relationship in terms of an interlocking one. Carson defines it like this. In other words, if John often usefully explains something in the synoptic gospels, the synoptists frequently provide information that enables us to make better sense of something in the fourth gospel. So Carson would say, we need to stop talking so much about some similarities and some differences, but we need to see that there is an interlocking relationship between John and the Synoptic Gospels. How do we account for this? Well, several points I want to give you. In Mark, Jesus appears to be well known in Jerusalem the second he shows up there. Uh, how is that the case given that Jerusalem is so far removed from Galilee where Jesus has been ministering? John gives us the key by letting us know that Jesus has gone to Jerusalem for various festivals along the course of his ministry. Another piece or point to this interlocking relationship is that in Mark, Jesus is accused at his trial of threatening the temple. However, he doesn't do this in any of the synoptic gospels. He does it in John 2.19. Destroy this temple and I will build it again in three days. So again, we see that interlocking relationship. A third part of this is that Mark gives no reason why Jewish authorities need Pilate's intervention in the trial. John explains this. John often takes a story that we know about from the Synoptic Gospels and gives us the why. He does the same thing when it comes to how on earth Peter gets into the high priest's courtyard during the trial of Jesus. John lets us know that he had a connection to get in. Uh, John also narrates contact that Jesus had with his disciples prior to their call to be disciples. We don't get that in the Synoptic Gospels. John gives the rationale to why Jesus exits the scene after feeding the 5,000. The synoptics don't really tell us. Jesus just kind of disappears for no reason. But John tells us that the people, that Jesus knew the people were about to make him king by force. And so he, after he feeds the 5,000, he leaves. And then finally, John provides a theology of exorcism or of casting out demons, whereas the synoptics simply record 
that Jesus did cast out demons. So many, many points here that show us we don't need to be afraid of the fact that John is very different than the Synoptic Gospels. They work together in dramatic ways. Let's look at the structure of John, and I want to appeal to uh, a few different theories that scholars have put forth. I think this is the theory in your textbook, and you'll see um, four parts to John's structure in this model. You have a prologue, this is where we get the poem that is often read at Christmas. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. This is probably an early Christian hymn, by the way. Then the Book of Seven Signs, the Book of Glory, and then an epilogue, chapter 21, which is probably a later edition, by the way, because the Gospel seems to end at chapter 20, and then chapter 21 is, uh, oh yeah, by the way, you know we want to say this as well. Let me talk more about this structure in just a moment. Um, other scholars, such as Hitchcock and, and Steve, suggest that John is actually a play. It's written to be a stage play in first century theater. You have a prologue, you have an epilogue, and they divide the text of John into five acts of a play. This is an interesting uh, view. And if when you're reading John on your own, if you think about various characters in a play representing the characters in John, it really does work. It really does make sense if you frame it that way in your head that this may have been written to be a play. Now another scholar, Segovia, suggests that the key to the structure of John is the travel of Jesus. And he divides the Gospel of John into four different journey cycles. Four different cycles in which Jesus goes from Galilee to Jerusalem and back. Uh, most basically, most basic is simply a twofold division to the Gospel of John. The first 12 chapters, we have a book of the signs of Jesus. All of the material is structured around these signs that Jesus performs, these miracles. And then chapters 13 and through 21, the emphasis shifts from signs to glory because we slowly come to realize in the Gospel of John that all this glory talk is leading toward the cross. And the great irony of John's message is that the cross is the place where the glory of God is most fully seen and realized. Um, last, let's look at the great big theological themes of John. There's going to be a bunch. John is such a, a theological gospel there are many theological emphases that he brings to bear in his telling of the story. First, of course, is the identity of Jesus. And John comes right out of the gate calling Jesus the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This word, Word, in the Greek language, in which John writes, is Logos. And Logos is a, a huge word in ancient Greek language. Let me give you a quote here from Zeno, who's a philosopher uh, from the ancient world. And here's what he calls Logos. He says, The general law which is Logos, or reason, pervading everything, is the same as Zeus, the supreme head of the government of the universe. So Logos is reason. Logos is uh, divine. Logos is the ordering reality of reality. It's the philosophical center of reality is Logos. And John tells us that right from the very first verse, he's going to be focusing on the identity of Jesus as the divine reality that pervades the entire world. Uh, none of the synoptics talk about Jesus as Logos the way that John does. And whereas in Mark, Mark tries to keep Jesus' identity a secret until the end, uh, John doesn't do that at all. He comes out of the gates calling Jesus Logos. Everybody knows the identity of Jesus in John. It's not, it's not as mysterious as it is in the Gospel of Mark. Another uh, emphasis in John is Jesus on trial. Um, this is where we get the theme, the third theme <coughs> of witness. John sets up these uh, scenes that are meant to remind you of a courtroom scene in which various witnesses come forth and speak about the identity of Jesus so that Jesus is sort of on trial even before we get to his actual historical trial. A uh, huge theme in the Gospel of John is belief and faith. John 3.16, that anyone who believes in him should have eternal life. Without the Gospel of John, we don't get this kind of Baptist idea of 
being saved, if you just believe you're saved. This is a John emphasis. We mentioned signs as an emphasis in John, uh, but I wanna, want you to know that even the way John structures his signs has meaning to it in that there are seven of them. John loves to play with the number seven. His gospel is, has a very sophisticated structure to it. Uh, another emphasis that's key to John is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. This is a Greek word that means advocate. And in John 13 through 17, in which Jesus is speaking to his disciples for uh, the last time before his death, he speaks a lot about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. It usually gets translated again as advocate, and you can read all about that in um, chapter 14 and 15. Of John. Also, in the Gospel of John, we get the wonderful I am sayings of the Gospels. I am the bread of life. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the bread from heaven. These, this is only in John. John. Jesus doesn't talk this way in the synoptics. And once again, there are seven of them. John uh, is just, again, so intentional and sophisticated with this structure. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. All of these wonderful I am statements. Another theme of John is the glorification of Jesus upon the cross. John is a brilliant storyteller, and we expect the glory of God to be triumphant, and instead the glory of God, as Jesus leads us to believe along the way the gospel of John will be the cross. Jesus says in John, when I be lifted up, then will I draw all men unto myself. So the glory of God is ultimately seen on the cross. Women are a key theme. In John, in fact, there are no negative portrayals of female characters. Women are always heroes in John, uh, which would suggest that there are probably key female leaders of John's church, and so it's important for him to include uh, prominent women in the telling of his story. Sacraments, key to John. We saw it in the verse we read at the beginning of our time together here. Uh, we see it throughout. When Jesus is stabbed with the spear, it's only in John, by the way, upon the cross, blood and water come from him. Why does John, what does that matter to John? Well, it refers to baptism and to the Lord's Supper. And there are many places in John where you get this wonderful uh, sacramental language. Re, what, what we call realized eschatology is a big deal in John. And eschatology is the end times. And realized would mean we realize end time stuff right now. Uh, this bringing the end times into our experience now is seen most famously in John's use of the term eternal life. Now, eternal life shows up a couple times in the synoptics, uh, mainly around Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler, but eternal life is a huge term in John, and it's not a temporal term. That is, it's not talking about a, qu a quantity of life after you die. It's a qualitative term. It's something you have right now. When you come to believe in Jesus, you have the eternal kind of life right now, according to John. The Old Testament is a huge theme for John. Uh, he's constantly interweaving references to the Old Testament. Misunderstanding is a big theme in John. The disciples seem to never understand, especially the male disciples, uh, what's happening, what Jesus means. Um, we get the antagonism of the world and the Jews in John. And unfortunately, when uh, Adolf Hitler needed a text to support his anti-Semitism, his campaign against the Jews, he just read John. And he took the way John uses this term, the Jews, completely out of context. John certainly doesn't mean to castigate all Jews that have ever lived. The Jews in John is a literary term that comes to symbolize the, the religious establishment in Jerusalem who opposes Jesus. He also uses the world in the same way. I grew up as a Pentecostal hearing a lot about avoiding the world. But the world isn't culture in John. It's, in, it's forces that are opposed to Jesus. So recognizing the way these terms function in John's literature is really, really important. And finally, we get this wonderful theme in John that Jesus is greater than John the Baptist. Um, that's a given in the Synoptic Gospels, but John really wants to emphasize that that John the Baptist uh, pointed the way to Jesus and said, 
Things like, I must become greater. He must become less. <laughs> well, guys, that's all I have this week. Uh, for next week, I'm hoping to be able to meet at our regularly scheduled time, once again, over video. So you'll have two weeks of video, but please, 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 if you're uncomfortable with any of the information, feel like I rushed through something, email me. Uh, call, we'll set up a phone conversation. Whatever we have to do, I'm certainly at your service as you continue in the course. I have graded your reflection papers. Uh, you did, did really, really wonderful. Almost all of you got an A that, that turned that into me, so I'm very happy with that. And uh, in three weeks, I'll give those graded back to you. Uh, so have a wonderful week. I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless.